Hi everyone, I'm here with the second part of our summary of diabetes and cardiovascular disease, which is based on the latest European Society of Cardiology guidelines. In our previous session, we covered diagnosis, risk assessment, glucose medications, lipid management, and blood pressure control. So what are we covering in this part? This time we will dive into individual diseases when they are combined with diabetes. We'll cover diabetes and coronary disease, diabetes and heart failure, diabetes and chronic kidney disease, diabetes with peripheral arterial disease, and arrhythmia in diabetes. Sounds interesting. Let's start. Yeah, let's start. How does diabetes impact chronic coronary disease? Looking from the diabetes side, coronary disease is responsible for 50 to 80% of the deaths in patients with type 2 diabetes. Looking from the coronary side, type 2 diabetes results in 28% higher chance of death, myocardial infarction, or stroke. The symptoms of coronary disease in patients with diabetes are usually less severe and may not follow a typical pattern. The Barry 2 study, which involved more than 2,000 patients with severe coronary disease and diabetes, only 19% experienced typical angina, while the remaining 81% had either atypical symptoms or showed no symptoms at all. Well, that should make a good case for screening to find silent disease in asymptomatic patients with diabetes. Actually, no. Screening for asymptomatic coronary disease in diabetes was a topic of debate. Most of the studies have not shown any significant benefit of routine screening compared to standard care. Therefore, it's generally not recommended to undergo non-invasive routine screening for coronary disease if there's diabetes and there are no symptoms. If we are not going to screen asymptomatic patients for coronary stenosis, then how should we manage their potentially hidden coronary disease? The management of asymptomatic patients should be the same as we mentioned in the previous episode, controlling the blood pressure, the LDL, hemoglobin A1C, physical exercise, body weight, diet, etc. And of course, it's important for high-risk individuals to be on an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Then, how about the symptomatic diabetic patients? For symptomatic diabetic patients, in addition to risk factor control that we just mentioned, we need to consider two important aspects of care, symptom relief and revascularization. For symptom relief, we have options like nitrates, evamiridine, calcium antagonists, but there's one interesting medication, which is ranolazine. It does not only reduce myocardial ischemia, but it also has a unique effect of reducing the hemoglobin A1c, especially in patients with poor metabolic control. Revascularization for chronic coronary disease is recommended for patients with uncontrollable symptoms or patients with a large ischemic burden. The choice between coronary bypass graft or percutaneous intervention depends on the extent of the disease. For patients with diabetes and multivessel disease, bypass graft with arterial grafts is preferred over complex PCI. Of course, as long as the patient characteristics allow for surgery, considering factors like frailty or cerebrovascular disease. PCI with newer generation drug eluting stents is acceptable for patients with less extensive disease. You can find more detailed information on the ACC AHA guidelines on myocardial revascularization in one of our previous episodes, and I will add the link in the description. That was for chronic patients. Then how do acute coronary syndromes differ in the presence of diabetes? 25% of patients with STEMI have a history of diabetes, and up to 40% can show a previously undiagnosed type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. Patients with diabetes tend to have atypical symptoms. They have a higher percentage of multivessel disease, multiple coronary lesions, with a higher percentage of vulnerable atherosclerotic plaques and more microvascular impairment. However, myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary disease, MINOCA, is observed less frequently in patients with diabetes than in those without diabetes. Besides, patients with diabetes may not always receive the best treatment options, like revascularization, reperfusion. This is because their symptoms are not always obvious and because they usually have diffuse disease and distal coronary disease. When these patients are admitted to the hospital, their blood sugar numbers may shoot. How should we manage the blood sugar in hospitalized patients with acute coronary syndromes? During the acute phase of acute coronary syndrome, the blood sugar levels may shoot. This can indicate stress-related hyperglycemia in some situations rather than diabetes. However, it's also important to note that acute coronary syndrome associated with hyperglycemia on hospital admission has a higher risk of death compared to those without hyperglycemia. Based on the available evidence, it's recommended to aim for a moderate glycemic control while avoiding hypoglycemia in the early stages of acute coronary syndromes. Insulin infusion should be only used if glycemic control cannot be achieved otherwise, and the target blood glucose should be below 180 to 200 mg per other than insulin, speaking of oral agents, 
Impact diffusion in acute myocardial infarction has been found to reduce pro-BNP levels and improve echocardiographic parameters and improve blood sugar without causing metabolic acidosis or diabetic ketoacidosis. To prevent hypoglycemia, frequent glucose testing, preferably every hour during the acute ACS phase, is advised, and continuous glucose monitoring has been shown to be more effective than capillary checks after an acute coronary syndrome. It's more effective in preventing hypoglycemia and in achieving proper control. Should patients with diabetes go to the cath lab early in the case of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome? Yes, having diabetes can increase the risk of cardiovascular events in ACS. And we know from a meta-analysis of eight different trials involving patients with non-ST elevation ACS that diabetes, elevated troponin levels, and a high GRACE score were all factors that predicted lower mortality rates when an early invasive strategy was used. This means that even if a patient doesn't have elevated troponin or doesn't have a high grace score, they can still benefit from an early invasive strategy if they have diabetes. Then, after intervention, what should be the dual antiplatelet regimen and for how long? It's recommended to take dual antiplatelets for 12 months after an acute coronary syndrome. It's not recommended to shorten or reduce the dose of dual antiplatelet therapy below 12 months in patients with diabetes who have had an ACS. Even in patients with diabetes who tolerated dual antiplatelet therapy without major bleeding following a myocardial infarction in the past one to three years, we can extend dual antiplatelet therapy up to three years. And there's no strong evidence supporting the use of platelet function testing to adjust the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy in diabetes. Proton pump inhibitors would significantly reduce the risk of gastrointestinal bleeding in patients who are taking a single or a dual antiplatelet agent. And by the way, low-dose aspirin and P2Y12 inhibitors have similar rates of gastrointestinal and non-gastrointestinal major bleeding. We are seeing increasing patients with angina or acute coronary syndrome with no obstructive coronary disease. Is diabetes related to that condition? Yes, having diabetes can increase the risk of microvascular disease due to factors like high blood sugar, insulin resistance, inflammation, reduced nitric oxide production, endothelial dysfunction, increased sympathetic activity, many molecular mechanisms. But when it comes to patients with INOCA, having type 2 diabetes can worsen the prognosis. It's important to note that in the absence of atherosclerosis, diabetes does not affect the size of the coronary arteries. Diabetic vessels have the same diameter as non-diabetic vessels. They may seem smaller, but that's due to diffuse disease. When it comes to treating ischemia, with no obstructive coronary disease, INOCA, the approach is the same for both diabetes and non-diabetes. Let's move on to heart failure and diabetes. How do diabetes and heart failure interact? Diabetes increases the risk of developing heart failure two to four times, and diabetes also results in chronic heart failure at an earlier age. One quarter to one third of patients with type 2 diabetes over the age of 60 may experience heart failure, which is mostly HFPEF, preserved ejection fraction. On the flip side, in a large European registry, 30% of stable heart failure patients also had diabetes. And in acutely hospitalized patients, the number can go up to 50%. Also having diabetes means higher risk of heart failure mortality, and how can diabetes result in heart failure? It's likely a mix of factors like hypertension, microvascular disease, hyperglycemia, or other complex mechanisms that can lead to heart failure without myocardial infarction, heart failure without ischemic heart disease. However, no matter the cause, it's crucial to screen patients with diabetes for heart failure, especially the elderly patients, because of the various interactions between the two conditions. How can we screen patients with diabetes for heart failure? In addition to history taking for heart failure symptoms, we have a clinical scoring system called WATCH-DM score. It can forecast the five-year heart failure risk in patients with type 2 diabetes using simple clinical variables without looking into echo or biomarkers, just the body mass index, age, blood pressure, serum creatinine, HDL, fasting blood glucose, QRS duration, previous MI, and coronary bypass crafts. We can also use biomarkers. We exclude heart failure if the BNP is less than 35 or less than 105 in atrial fibrillation. For N-terminal pro-BNP, we exclude if it's less than 125 and less than 365 in atrial fibrillation, keeping in mind that the values will be lower in obese and in women, and the values can be higher in chronic kidney disease or advanced age. Are the same heart failure treatments valid for patients with diabetes? Or are there any necessary modifications? The effects of the heart failure medications are consistent in both diabetes and non-diabetes. But because patients with diabetes have higher absolute risk, then the absolute benefit is also higher. We now understand that starting and increasing the four essential pillars, RNA, beta blocker, MRE, and SGLT2 inhibitor, is more beneficial than starting late and increasing slowly. As for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the same principles apply for diabetes as non-diabetes.
How should we handle blood sugar lowering medications in the setting of heart failure? Here, the first option, of course, will be an SGLT2 inhibitor because it offers dual benefits as both heart failure medication and a sugar lowering medication. That makes perfect sense. But what effects do GLP-1 receptor agonists have on heart failure? Most GLP-1 receptor agonists were neutral with the risk of heart failure hospitalization, mortality, or ejection fraction. There was one exception with semaglutide in heart failure preserved ejection fraction, where it improved functional class and quality of life, although it's not clear if it had any effects on mortality or hospitalization. And how heart failure friendly are other blood sugar lowering therapies? Traditionally, metformin was contraindicated in decompensated heart failure, but recent trials didn't show a negative impact of metformin on heart failure. So in the latest guidelines, metformin gets a class 2A recommendation for heart failure. TPP4 inhibitors, cetagliptin and linagliptin had neutral effects. Saxagliptin and alloglyptin increased the risk of heart failure. Insulin was neutral in its effect on heart failure hospitalizations. And of course, TZTs are not recommended in heart failure because they promote weight gain and edema. Got it. So, is there a sequence of priority in diabetes medications used in heart failure, like we had for cardiovascular protection? Yes, we start by an SGLT2 inhibitor. If we need additional blood sugar control, we can add a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Then we think of linagliptin, cetagliptin, metformin, or insulin. Good. The next topic, is diabetes related to arrhythmia? Yes, diabetes may increase the risk of cardiac arrhythmia via several factors, including the associated comorbidities of hypertension, coronary disease, or diabetes-associated factors like glucose control or diabetic neuropathy. These arrhythmia may be atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmia, or sudden death. Let's start by the most common arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation. Yes, diabetes increases the risk of atrial fibrillation by 40% when both conditions coexist, this means a higher rate of mortality, heart failure, and stroke. And of course, comorbidities like hypertension and obesity worsen the prognosis further. And intensive glucose lowering to a target less than 6 resulted in similar atrial fibrillation rates compared to more lenient control, A1C less than 8. And since asymptomatic silent atrial fibrillation is not uncommon, patients with diabetes should be opportunistically screened for atrial fibrillation by, the, by palpating the pulse or by doing an ECG. Diabetes gets one point in the SHADS-VASC score. Patients with diabetes usually have a higher SHADS-VASC score because of the common comorbidities like hypertension, age, and vascular disease. The management of atrial fibrillation is the same in patients with diabetes and non-diabetes. Got it. Let's move into ventricular arrhythmia and sudden death. Yes, a few things to mention about sudden death in diabetes. The risk of sudden cardiac death is twofold higher in patients with diabetes. The mechanisms could be due to sympathetic activity, cellular calcium overload, or other mechanisms. Also, hypoglycemia has been associated with nocturnal death, known as the dead in bed syndrome in type 1 diabetes. Now let's move on to a big topic chronic kidney disease and diabetes. Yes, nephropathy caused by diabetes is a leading cause of chronic kidney disease globally. That's why screening patients with diabetes for chronic kidney disease is recommended at least annually. We do that by measuring serum creatinine and deriving the EGFR, and also by measuring urinary albumin to creatinine ratio. And then we stage the severity of kidney disease based on both variables. Chronic kidney disease is a cause of concern it intimidates patients with a progression to dialysis. It also increases cardiovascular risk as the EGFR declines. Patients with chronic kidney disease have more calcification of atherosclerotic plaques related to disordered calcium phosphate metabolism, known as chronic kidney disease mineral bone disorder. Obesity is a common risk factor for both type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and interventions that promote weight loss in patients with type 2 diabetes reduce the risk of developing chronic kidney disease over the long term. Based on that, diabetes therapies need to achieve two goals. Number one, delay or halt the progression to end stage renal disease. Number two, reduce cardiovascular events. Yes, as we mentioned earlier, statins reduce the cardiovascular risk in patients with diabetes, but for some reason, they are less effective in chronic kidney disease. As the EGFR declines, we see smaller reductions in cardiovascular risk per millimole per liter reduction in the LDL cholesterol, with major doubts regarding their efficacy in patients with dialysis. This diminution in risk reduction as the EGFR decreases implies that we need more intensive LDL cholesterol lowering regimens to achieve the same results. And also statins do not slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. Then, which drugs would do both? Lower the cardiovascular risk and slow the decline in kidney functions? Three classes can do that. Renin angiotensin system inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, MRE. Let's take them one by one. First, renin angiotensin blockers. 
Blocking the renin angiotensin system with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, Erbisartan, Losartan, prevented kidney failure in patients with diabetes and overt nephropathy. So, despite the concerns of hyperkalemia and initial worsening of serum creatinine, we need to use these agents in patients with chronic kidney disease. But there's no point in combining an angiotensin receptor blocker with an ACE inhibitor, as large trials have identified an increased risk of hyperkalemia and acute kidney injury without demonstrable benefit from dual renin angiotensin system blockade. Okay, second class would be the SGLT2 inhibitors. Yes, the advantage of SGLT2 inhibitors is threefold. Number one, they reduce the risk of death, myocardial infarction, and stroke. Number two, they reduce the risk of heart failure, mortality, and hospitalization across the spectrum of ejection fraction. Although lower EGFR attenuates the hemoglobin A1C lowering effect, meta-analysis of all SGLT2 inhibitor trials showed that the benefits of these medications on the risk of heart failure and hospitalization are unmodified by the low EGFR. The third benefit is that they slow down the progression of chronic kidney disease. We have three large trials on dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, and canagliflozin in chronic kidney disease with and without diabetes, and the three trials showed a consistent reduction in the risk of progression to end-stage renal disease. These results should encourage the initiation of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with chronic kidney disease down to an EGFR of 20 ml per minute, and we can continue to use them until the need for kidney replacement therapy. Also, adding an SGLT2 inhibitor can mitigate the risk of hyperkalemia induced by RAS blockers or MRAs. Third is MRA. Do you mean spironolactone? No, I don't mean spironolactone. I mean phenerenone. This is a non-steroidal MRA. It does not cause gynecomastia. It reduces the blood pressure and albuminuria in patients with chronic kidney disease. And we have trials on chronic kidney disease and diabetes. Trials showed that phenerenone reduced the risk of renal failure and reduced cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, stroke, and heart failure hospitalization. So phenerenone is recommended as an addition to renin angiotensin system inhibitors in patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. We will elaborate more on phenerenone in coming episodes. Okay, then... Do we have a sequence of preferred drugs in patients with chronic kidney disease? Yes, to reduce the cardiovascular risk, it's statins. To reduce the risk of renal failure, renin angiotensin system blockers. To reduce both, we have SGLT2 inhibitors and phenerenone. If we need further blood sugar control after using SGLT2 inhibitor, we can think of a GLP-1 receptor agonist. If we require more blood sugar lowering, we can use metformin if the EGFR is more than 30, DPP-4 inhibitors, and of course, insulin. Okay. Now let's move on to diabetes and peripheral arterial disease. Yes, peripheral arterial disease and diabetes interact. 20 to 30% of patients with diabetes have lower extremity arterial disease. Patients with diabetes develop disease at a younger age and have a faster progression of the disease, with more patients ending in critical limb ischemia. Up to 30% of patients with intermittent claudication and 60 to 70% of patients with critical limb ischemia have diabetes. Patients with diabetes have occlusions of the infrapopliteal vessels more often. They have more severe calcification and more collateral circulation. The presence of microvascular disease such as retinopathy, nephropathy, or neuropathy also increase the risk of amputation. Pain is often masked because of the peripheral neuropathy. Therefore, atherosclerosis is often more advanced with tissue loss when it's first diagnosed. Therefore, screening and early diagnosis are very important to allow early treatment and prevent major amputation. And the most handy screening tool would be the ankle brachial index, keeping in mind that the accuracy of the ankle brachial index is lower in patients with diabetes because of calcification and non-compressible vessels. And regardless of lower extremity arterial disease, an abnormal ankle brachial index means an increased risk of cardiovascular events. Medical management of lower extremity arterial disease in patients with diabetes, it includes SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, and there's no risk of amputation with empagliflozin or dapagliflozin. Rivaroxaban 2.5 twice daily reduces the major adverse cardiac events and also the major adverse limb events, including amputations, when it's added to aspirin. Especially patients with peripheral arterial disease tend to derive higher benefit in both coronary events and limb-related events. When we talk about peripheral disease, aneurysms also come to mind. Are abdominal aortic aneurysms and diabetes related? This is probably the only case where diabetes is protective. Current evidence shows a lower risk of developing aortic aneurysms in patients with diabetes. Patients with diabetes also have smaller aortic aneurysms and have slower growth rates compared to controls. This could be related to changes in extracellular matrix, collagen, reduced neovascularization. Also, metformin and glitazone seem to have some protective effect from the development of abdominal aortic aneurysms. Here we come to the end of this episode. We have covered several aspects of diabetes and cardiovascular disease, right? Yes, we did, but we didn't cover everything. We didn't cover type 1 diabetes. We didn't cover carotid disease and diabetes. 
I encourage our audience to read the guidelines. I will add a link to the full text in the description. I hope that the two episodes were useful and they can be useful further in studying for the boards or postgraduate exams. And see you in the coming episode.